The best speech teacher I ever had was a drug-dealing gang member who had probably murdered three people. And I was his student for less than 10 seconds. I met him several years ago when I was in my early 20s. I had just finished speaking at a major motivational speaking event held in the city of Chicago. In fact, I was one of three young, up-and-coming motivational speakers who had been invited to be the opening act for the featured speaker. And the featured speaker was the best, most popular, most successful motivational speaker in the world at that time. A childhood hero of mine, whose name I will not call, but suffice it to say, uh, I had read all of his books, I had listened to all of his cassette tapes, and I had watched all of his PBS specials. He was a childhood hero of mine, so I was excited about this opportunity to share the stage with him. And so we get to the event, we get to the venue, and a few minutes before the event begins, we're called backstage for a huddle. It's five of us in the huddle. It's me and the other two young, up-and-coming motivational speakers, my childhood hero, the most popular, most successful motivational speaker in the world at that time, and the program coordinator. Now, the program coordinator lets us know that this event is sponsored by two groups. It's co-sponsored by two groups. The first group is a collection of some of the most influential civic leaders in the city of Chicago, business leaders, uh, politicians, uh, church leaders, and the second group is a group of former members of some of the most violent, most notorious gangs in the city of Chicago. And then it happens. My enthusiasm and excitement instantly turns to worry, <laughs> dread, and fear. And the reason why I'm worried is not because this is a large crowd. That's not what worries me. What worries me is the advice that the program coordinator is giving us. It goes a little something like this. <clears throat> you must keep in mind, this is a diverse event. Not only are there civic leaders in the audience, politicians and business leaders, but also in the audience are some gang members. There are some drug dealers in this audience. There are some criminals in this audience. They're from the hood. In fact, this whole experience is really for them. So we need you to relate to them. We need you to speak their language. The more like them you are, the better you'll do on stage. And I can instantly hear the theme music from Jaws going on in my head. It's almost as if I can see Jason stepping out of the shadows with a machete and a hockey mask. This is about to be a disaster of epic proportions. So we take the stage, we take the stage to thunderous applause, and the first speaker, the first of the three young, up-and-coming motivational speakers, takes the microphone. And here's how she begins. <clears throat> I can tell by the way you all are looking at me, that you're wondering, can she speak my language? I mean, you see me in my fancy dress and my jewelry, and you're wondering if I can relate to you. Well, just so you know, I'm from the hood, just like all of you. Hey, anybody remember playing double dutch in the street when you were a kid? And then for the next 10 minutes, she mimics jumping rope on stage all the while singing some song about little Sally Walker and then segueing into Miss Mary Mack. And her speech is a flop. She sits down 10 minutes later to stone silence. Nobody in the audience is saying a word, no applause, nothing. And so the second speaker takes the stage and either he is doing the absolute worst impression of Bishop T.D. Jakes I have ever heard, or he's constipated, or, or both, could have been both. Here's how he begins. 
I need you to touch three people and tell them if you can believe it, you can achieve it. Come on, touch your neighbor, touch, which is definitely something we wouldn't want to do today in this age of the coronavirus. I ain't touching nobody. But he said, look, touch, touch three people and tell them if you can believe it, you can achieve it. And they laugh him off the stage, and justifiably so. It's at this moment that the world's greatest motivational speaker, my childhood hero, he and I were seated next to each other on stage. He leans over to me at this point and says, okay, Derek, change in plan. This, this event is falling apart. This event is, 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 is falling apart. My name is on the marquee, so I've got to do something. I've got to rescue this event. Change of plans. I'm going to come on next, and then you can follow me. But I've got to rescue this event. We're losing them. And so my childhood hero, most successful motivational speaker in the world at that time, takes the microphone, takes off his suit jacket, loosens his tie, and here's how he begins. You know, I'm a parent. I have children who are your age. I have young people who are in their 20s, just like many of you. So I know how to speak your language. So I'm going to come down to your level, and I'm going to rap to you. Can you dig where I'm coming from? And that is no exaggeration. He said, I'm going to come down to your level, and I'm going to rap to you. Can you dig where I'm coming from? And in my head, I'm saying to myself, yeah, I can dig where you're coming from. Obviously, you're coming from the 1970s because that's the way Starsky and Hutch, Superfly, and Dolomite used to speak. I'm like, no, somebody make the bleeding stop. I was half expecting him to do his Jimmy J.J. Walker impression. Dynamite! I said, stop it, stop it. And of course, another flop. And now I <laughs> have to follow all of that. Three flops and Derek, yay! So I take the stage, microphone in one hand, and my other hand in my pocket. And for the next 10 minutes, I just tell them the 10-minute version of my life story. How for the first 12 years of my life, I was in speech therapy every day. I had a severe stutter. I could barely talk. I was always being made fun of. And now here I am on stage with my childhood hero, the greatest motivational speaker in the world, dreams come true. And I'm noticing about halfway through my presentation, the audience members are crying. Some of them are crying visibly. Some of them are crying audibly. And when I get done, I receive the only ovation of the night, a standing ovation, which I was not expecting. And that's when I met the best speech teacher I ever had. At the post-event meet and greet, where the audience members got a chance to meet uh, the speakers who were on stage that night, I am approached by this huge dude with gold chains dripping down his neck and a tattoo of three teardrops on his face, symbolic of his having killed three people. I later found out that this guy was the most notorious drug smuggler in Chicago. The feds just did not have enough evidence on him to put him away, but everybody knew who this guy was. And this dude, with gold chains dripping down his neck and real tears dripping from his eyes, said to me, I felt that. Little man, I felt you. There's a lot of advice out there on how to be a better public speaker. As a matter of fact, if you do a Google search of those words, how to be a better public speaker, you'll get at least 299 million hits. 299 million. There are articles uh, with titles such as 27 ways to get better at public speaking and the top nine characteristics of effective public speakers. And my all-time favorite, want to be a better speaker? Do what the pros do. But what if I were to tell you that the key to being an effective public speaker, whether you are speaking on stage with a microphone in front of an audience, or whether you're speaking in a boardroom to your colleagues at work, or whether you're doing a presentation to your stockholders, or whether you're a college student giving the presentation to your peers, what if I were to tell you that the most effective public speaking tips 
cannot be found and will probably never be found in an article or a book. What if I were to tell you that the key to being an effective public speaker has been with you all along? You probably just didn't know it. And it's a whole lot easier than you think it is. Here it is. Listen closely. The most effective public speakers are those who are the most comfortable simply being themselves. Now, this is not to say that one should never take the advice of an expert. This is not to say that one should never read an article, one should never read a book. The point is not to lose your greatest asset in pursuit of greatness. And your greatest asset is simply this. No one can beat you being you. See, we live in a society, we live in a society that seems to reward sameness. We live in a society that rewards us for uh, following the herd. We live in a society in which we are told to listen to the experts and do everything the way the experts do. In fact, I bet you can help me with my presentation tonight. I need everybody, whether you're here in the auditorium or watching by video, I need everybody to complete these sentences for me. Complete these sentences for me. When in Rome, imitation is the sincerest form of fake it until, see what I'm talking about? <laughs> we are bombarded with uh, statements like that that try to get us to follow the herd. But instead of fake it until you make it, how about this instead? If you fake it, you'll never make it. That's why my public speaking hero, my motivational speaking hero, and my colleagues crashed and burned on that stage over 20 years ago. They were speaking in voices and personas that were not genuinely their own. I'll say it again because repetition is the parent of pedagogy. The most effective public speakers are those who are the most comfortable simply being themselves. I have read a lot of books on public speaking, and there are some books that give you some really, really crazy advice. In fact, I know some potentially great speakers who end up failing because they're given advice that's not very helpful. Uh, I was working with a CEO one time because I'm, I'm a speech coach. In addition to being a keynoter, I'm also an executive speech coach. I work with people to help them to become better speakers. So I was working with a CEO from a company in California, and he said, Derek, I need to give a presentation to my stockholders, and everybody tells me that you need to have jokes. Everybody tells me that you need to be funny. Everyone tells me you need to be humorous. Can you teach me how to be funny? How can I be funny? And I said to him, dude, if you have to ask how to be funny, you're not funny. Don't even try it. Show of hands. How many of you have ever heard a presentation that did not make you laugh one time, but it was a great presentation? Show of hands. See, you don't have to be funny. See, the experts say you need 1.5 jokes per page. Uh, I have read books that even spend an entire chapter telling you how to stand when you speak. An entire chapter telling you how to stand. Your feet need to be so many centimeters apart. Your shoulders need to be perpendicular to the square root of the hypotenuse. When did we have to start doing math in order to be effective speakers? I have even read a book, and, and no disrespect to the author, I love this author, I've read several of his books, but I even read a book entitled Talk Like Ted. I don't want to talk like Ted because I'm not Ted. I want to speak like Derek. There is even a series of speaking events that requires its speakers to stand in the middle of a red dot the entire time they're speaking. Can you imagine? Maybe instead of telling people to think outside the box, we also need to tell people to step outside the dot. You should see the program directors right now. They're going nuts. Oh my God, Dr. Noble stepped outside the dot. Get them back into the dot. That dot staying there and I'm staying here. Here's the reason why. If you force yourself to stay in the dot the entire time, then you end up becoming a pale imitation of what you think a good speaker should be. 
And a good speaker is one who is authentic. Authenticity is the key to connection. See, that's why that drug dealer said to me, I felt you. We only feel that which is genuine and authentic. Now, authenticity is a journey that might take you a while, but I can at least get you started on that journey. I can give you the first step on that journey. You want to know the first step on the journey to authenticity? The first step is you have to become comfortable in your own skin. You have to accept yourself, warts and all. I love the way Mandy Hale puts it. Watch what Mandy Hale says. Mandy Hale says, just be yourself. Let people see the real imperfect, flawed, quirky, weird, beautiful, magical person that you are. I've been a professional speaker now for over 20 years, and I do everything wrong <laughs> in my keynoting and in my coaching, whether it's uh, live coaching or virtual coaching. I do everything the books tell you not to do. Some of that is intentional. Some of it is quite unintentional. First of all, I'm a stutterer. I mean, I stutter all throughout my childhood, and my stutter has gotten better, but I still stutter every now and then. I'm a stutterer. I have a lisp. You know, people make fun of Mike Tyson. My lisp is worse. I try my best to avoid words that have the letter S. Good luck with that. I'm a stutterer. I have a lisp. And on top of all that, I talk too fast. And yet... I average 290 paid speaking engagements per year, 290, and not one time have I ever had a CEO or an attendee or anybody come to me and say, you know what, you stuttered too much, you, you, uh, uh, you had a lift, you talked too fast, I want my money back. Not one time. Maybe the number one rule of being an effective public speaker is get rid of the rule book. More than 20 years ago, a teary-eyed, drug-dealing gang member gave me an amazing gift. He gave me permission to be myself. And now I pass that gift along to all of you watching me. I, Derek Noble, do hereby give you permission not to be Tony Robbins, not to be Brene Brown, not to be Steve Jobs. I give you permission to simply be yourself. That's an idea worth sharing, and I didn't even have to kill three people. <laughs> Thank you.